There's another major thing going on all during the war, and that's the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, the UK is dependent upon supplies, much like Japan. Uh, without a lot of raw materials coming in, that island group is going to lose in a big hurry. In 1941, you can see the dots on the, on the map there are sinkings of British, American, other merchant ships. Um, by the time the Americans get into the war, look at all the dots around the United States. All of a sudden, we found out we weren't very well prepared in this country for anti-submarine warfare. The German submarine fleet moved off to the western Atlantic, and wow, are the pickings great along the coast of the United States. It took a lot of time, uh, well over two years basically, before convoy systems, air cover, new weaponry, the breaking of the Enigma uh, uh, code, uh, uh, the German naval codes broken to where all of a sudden we're figuring out where those submarines are and the Germans don't know why we know they're there. The bottom line is the vaunted uh, submarine forces of the Germans were decimated. In the end, uh, Hitler lost over 800 uh, uh, submarines, and in fact, 90% of the men in the Kriegsmarine who were in submarine service never returned home. A, a tremendous campaign, but one that was vital to keeping the UK open. Some pictures of merchant shipping going down. Uh, about 175 warships and 3,500 merchant ships were sunk by U-boats uh, during the war. A tremendously expensive campaign in terms of resources and manpower. Uh, we would go after the submarines primarily by air uh, with naval forces supporting, but uh, all kinds of resources brought to bear to make this work, and including throwaway fighters. Put a fighter on a merchant ship, one shot, the, the Germans are out there, you launch them, you can attack enemy aircraft, submarines, and then this guy ends up landing in the water. Uh, hopefully somebody comes and picks them up before the cold water of the Atlantic overcomes them. So air is, is the logic for uh, using mostly air power after the submarines based on just how quickly you can get to them as opposed to having to go by sea? Yeah, you can, air power can cover a, an area a, a lot bigger and a lot yeah. faster than surface ships can. You get a contact and hey, it's not, there's nothing wrong with having surface ships and air power. Yeah. You put more resources against the target and you stand a better chance of killing it. Um, so here's the, uh, uh, not a fun job necessarily, hours and hours in the air, day after day, uh, uh, droning along, looking for telltale signs of a submarine, and that was an important aspect. But the point we really want to drive all this toward is the air power aspect of the war, and here's where the combined bomber offensive comes in. Uh, this is much like what we're going to see in the Pacific in, in a short while. Um, but the bombing of cities, but primarily on the part of the Americans at least, precision bombing by day of your military targets, using the Norden bomb site, precise target, uh, targeting of marshalling yards, indus industrial factories, uh, shipyards, you name it, by the British night bombing because they learned early on that, hey, you take a lot of losses in the daytime and decided to switch over in 1939 to night bombing after they were losing a lot of bombers early on. Um, at Casablanca in 1942, it was finally agreed between the Americans and the British with a lot of salesmanship from the U.S. Army Air Forces, they were not going to give away their bombers as support for the RAF. We will bomb by day. The British will bomb by night. We will do a combined bomber offensive that is hitting Germany, the Reich, the occupied countries hour after hour, day after day, round the clock, doesn't matter, but they will never have any rest. And that's essentially what happened all the way through uh, April of 1945, when essentially strategic bombing started as the Reich was being rolled up in May. Um, we had the 8th Air Force in England, uh, the Blue Circle, and then the Blue Areas down in the south, 1st, 12th Air Force out of North Africa, becoming 15th Air Force and, and 12th, uh, bombing out of Italy, and covered 
basically all the territory you see covered in red. A huge campaign. Just some examples of, of uh, what you might see. Rail marshaling yards. Yes, that used to be, you can see tracks coming in into the, looks like the craters of the moon in the center there. That's in Rhina, Germany on the 21st of March, 1945. Uh, industry. Uh, if you can stop industry from making things, and that's the object of strategic bombing, if you can't get things to the troops in the field, the troops in the field can't fight you. Um, that's what a factory looked like. In fact, this is the Schweinfurt Ball uh, Bearing Factory uh, in Regensburg, um, and then the Messerschmitt Factory. Uh, uh, these, these were tremendously... Effective raids temporarily, because the Germans had an uncanny ability to rebuild factories, but they were also very costly to the Americans. We found in, on this two raids in particular, Schweinfurt, Regensburg, uh, that, boy, we lost 60 air, uh, airplanes with 10 guys each, plus another bunch wounded, other airplanes damaged, and had to re kind of group at that point and get, uh, get air power that could escort these bombers. And the bomber will get through, but it may get through not unscathed. And that was a watchword of 1930s technology and, and doctrine that the bomber will always get through. Well, we found out that we took losses doing it. Um, the shipyards, obviously, if you can stop submarines in the port, you don't have to worry about them out in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, this is Wilhelmshaven in Germany after an attack. The raids against the oil refineries, again, oil became the watchword, particularly at the end of the war. Oil refineries were the primary targets along with transportation centers as we advanced across Europe. Another low-level raid at Ploiesh uh, by uh, B-24s nailed the oil factories, nailed the refineries, stop the oil from flowing, the machine will grind to a halt. But after stopping a lot of that, or the Russians occupying oil fields, synthetic oil, mostly coal, distillate, and other processes, became primary targets. That's an oil, uh, an oil refinery uh, manufacturing synthetic oil at Common, Germany on 11 September 1944. And then the controversial part, we talk about the cities. Yes, there are industries in cities, there's people in cities, there are going to be casualties. And with the bombing technology of World War II, which was dumb bombs dropped by uh, inexperienced crews being shot at, uh, scared to death, uh, uh, winds, the, the, just not the kind of uh, precision that we have today, you were going to take substantial civilian casualties. The UK lost about 61,000 during the war, probably uh, 300 to 600,000 Germans in the various attacks because their cities were pounded so hard, particularly by the RAF. Uh, Italian citizens, 50,000, the numbers go on and on. But I want to end this part on World War II in Europe uh, with this chart. It, it's understand that any number dealing with how many people died in World War II is because of the nature of a very, very long conflict, an estimate. But nobody will go below 60 million people killed in the war total, and the numbers as, uh, range as high as maybe 85 million all total. You can see relative contributions of deaths by the various countries, the Soviet Union uh, with China, and remember, both of these are allies. Okay, so when you look at the pie chart down there with allied civilians, 58% of the casualties of World War, or the deaths, not the casualties, the deaths of World War II, um, yes, a lot of those Chinese and Russian civilians. The United States essentially no civilian casualties, a uh, little over 300,000 uh, under arms that were killed. 300,000 compared to the 10, 12 million Russian soldiers. Uh, a lot of it's caused by bombing, but most people find this hard to believe, but bombing killed far, far fewer people than famine, sieges of cities like Leningrad and right. Stalingrad, um, a starvation. A number of people in the Soviet Union died because of policies set up by Stalin, probably the greatest mass murderer in history, um, of his own people and others. 
Um, it was a tremendously uh, a difficult war. But this will give you an idea of some of the concepts that we're going to have to look at as we investigate the decision to use the atomic bombs in Japan. And another lesson, we'll move into the Pacific.